So my name is Jade Ritchie. I'm a Yes23 spokesperson and uh, my professional background is that um, for about 20 years I've been a public servant in both Queensland and the Northern Territory, predominantly in youth justice but then more broadly in Aboriginal affairs. So um, I was the Director of Aboriginal Affairs in the Northern Territory and then I started doing a similar role um, for the Australian Government and I was based in Arnhem Land. Um, so I guess the professional side, uh, you know, my career has shown me a lot of um, the issues experienced, particularly in remote communities the disadvantage that Indigenous people are experiencing and we can go further into that. Um, but that's really compelled me to um, be on the Yes campaign because I want to see these uh, systems change and the way we work out policy and legislation needs to change. Um, I'm also a mum. Um, I have two beautiful teenagers that I'm raising in the Northern Territory. So again, I I'm on the Yes campaign because I want to make sure that their futures are bright. I want to make sure that they live in a unified and um, fair country. So that's why I'm doing this. I usually live in Darwin. Um, I am a Garang Garang woman. So I come from the Garang Garang nation and I was brought up um, on my grandmother's country. Oh, okay, cool. I can see you have a lot of passions for this campaign. Like, um, can you like introduce a little bit about history behind this referendum and why has this government called for the world, please? Yeah, I think it's important to talk about our history and to acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have existed on these lands for over 60,000 years. And then following white settlement in 1788, we were dispossessed of our lands and faced over 200 years of policies that were made about us, not with us. And some of those policies have been extremely harmful. Policies like uh, the Stolen Generation, which was the forcible removal of our children. Yeah. And then those children went to grow up in institutions yeah. and uh, terribly traumatised by that. You know, imagine being stolen from your parents and then taken to an institution where you receive no love or education. So that generation has had a lot of issues since then. We want to make sure um, that those sort of policies never happen again. We want to make sure that when policies and legislation are, are made about Indigenous affairs, they're made with our advice. So the voice is about us being able to give government advice so they make better policy and legislation for us. The recognition part of this is that, you know, over the last few decades, Australia has come a long way on the path towards reconciliation. And part of this journey has been a desire by Australians to recognise Indigenous Australians in the Constitution. Yeah. So the Constitution was made in 1900. And around that table was only one type of person. It was all only white men. There were no women. There were no multicultural views. And there were no Indigenous people that contributed to the Constitution. That's not reflective of the nation we are now. In this nation, we listen to women and multicultural um, communities and, um, you know, and we really value diverse perspectives. So it makes sense that we need to change the constitution yeah. because it's no longer reflective of who we are and who we wanna be as a unified nation. So we are asking to make this change to the constitution that will recognize Indigenous people as the first people of this country and it will give us a voice so we can have a say on policy and legislation that affects us. So I can see. Um, so our next question is do all Indigenous people want this? I can see yes. An overwhelming majority of yes. 
Indigenous people want this. Yeah. Absolutely. And Indigenous people have invited all Australians to come on this journey with us. And we're asking all voting Australian citizens to vote yes, yes. on the 14th of October. You're voting yes for recognition, inclusion, and a fairer nation. And voting no would just mean things stay the same. And the way things are now, let's talk about some of the experiences we're having as Indigenous people. There is real disadvantage. We still have um, terrible house, health outcomes. So statistics show that um, Indigenous people Indigenous people's life expectancy is about a decade less mm -hmm. than non-Indigenous people. We have over-representation in the justice system. In fact, Indigenous people are the most incarcerated people on the planet. You know, these things need to change. Mm -hmm. And our kids' educational outcomes are far less than others. So what we want to make sure is that we can share our lived experience, our good advice and our solutions to change that disadvantage that we're experiencing right now. We want to be responsible for that. We want to be heard and make that change ourselves. Yeah. So could you like a little bit describe so if the referendum is successful and what will the change for the Torres Strait Island people and Indigenous people in the future? So the change would be that we actually get to have some say over what happens to us. It will also mean there will be greater transparency um, and accountability on how money is spent on Aboriginal affairs. So right now, we're all frustrated that government is spending public money, lots of money on Aboriginal issues, but it's not being spent in the right way and it's not making a difference to us on the ground. So by getting, by giving good advice leads to better decisions, leads to better outcomes, it will save money. If government's not wasting it on things that we don't want and need. So by, you think about any time you make a decision. If you are making a big decision, you go and get advice. You might seek advice from your parents or a business advisor or someone to give you that advice to make the best decision so that you know you're spending your money in the right way. That's what we're offering to government. Good advice so that they spend money on things that will make proper change and stop wasting money. The other thing that's important about that, after the referendum, if we have a voice, we will see better outcomes for Indigenous people and we will see public money saved. There is no risk to anyone with this. There's only good things to be gained, nothing to lose. I want to be really clear that us having a voice, Aboriginal people establishing an advisory committee does not take anything from anybody else. An advisory committee does not charge additional taxes, it will not take your home, it will not take your business, it will not take your superannuation, it will simply give advice to government. We don't want to be taking all those things, we want to be giving access to our culture, you know, and that's the beautiful thing, there's nothing to lose out of this proposal, but there's a lot to gain. We can gain better outcomes and every Australian gains a more unified country. And you know, we have 60,000 years of culture to share. And I know that's really important to the Chinese community. Um, we are so grateful for your culture that you share with us. You know, I've got friends at the Moon Festival right now and you know, we, we love being part of your cultural festivals and, and learning about your culture. And we want to do the same thing. We want all Australians to be proud of the continued connection and culture from this land that they live on. Yeah, I think so. Like, I think most of the Chinese people would love to hear the Indigenous people's story and also their culture. We're quite interested in that. I think the major concern for the Chinese public is that 
they are worried about if the tax ration will be increased and if not. So there's any like no negative negative impact to any others outside indigenous people. That's right. So <clears throat> so an advisory committee cannot charge taxes. It cannot take homes, it cannot affect people's businesses. It is simply an advisory committee, a body that represents Indigenous interests and provides advice. Um, we have had lots of legal minded people. We've had high court judges give us this advice and reassure everyone that there is no legal risk. And common sense tells you that a body that gives advice is not a body that can take your home or anything else you've worked really hard for. And, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people just want the same outcomes as everybody else. And, you know, one of the things is currently in communities, economic participation is very difficult because um, these are very remote communities and we would like meaningful employment and to be, um, to have self-determination and have our own responsibility over our lives. But for the last 200 or so years, government has controlled Indigenous people with, with harmful policy. So what we would like to see is the same opportunities as everybody else. Indigenous people, you know, myself included, are very hardworking, loving people, and we just want the same opportunity as everybody else. And we know the solutions for our communities. We just need a government that will listen. And by establishing a voice, it means that regardless of which government is in power, there will be an advisory committee to give them that advice. And that's why we want to enshrine this voice in the constitution. It secures the voice. It means that we can consistently provide good advice. Yeah. yeah. But so again, Grace, I want to be very clear. There is no risk to anyone here. Nothing will be taken away from people, but the gift will be equity, yeah. inclusion, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people being heard just on the things that affect us. So I can see you, you are not only just to protect yourself, but also want to contribute to the society and also the multicultural things. Oh, 100%. You know, the biggest vision I have is, a, is my children growing up in a unified nation and a culturally rich nation where they can be proud to share their culture and they can be grateful to accept your culture. Yeah. And everyone gets to um, be proud and be heard and be seen, you know? And, and I think that likely the Chinese community can understand that desire to be heard and seen and included. And I truly want that for everybody in our communities. I'm gonna ask about like a really tricky question. Yeah. So why shouldn't the other migrant communities in Australia have a voice enshrined in the constitution? Because like Chinese communities are also like um, not the major part in Australia. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. so I think I think what this the recognition component is about recognizing that Indigenous people have had a continued connection um, to this land for over sixty thousand years. Now, historically, that was left out of the history books. Historically, um, the truth was not told about settlement and what happened when um, white settlers came to Australia. What's happened in the last few decades, though, is that Australians have demanded the truth. And I think that's really been, uh, there's been a positive contribution from migrant communities to say, we actually wanna know the real history here. And I think migrant communities are really, and, and, and you said before, you know, really interested in our culture. So we have the science that proves that we were here for tens of thousands of years before settlement. We have Australian people that accept and agree that we were here. 
we just need our constitution to reflect that as well, recognize that we were here. So there's a difference there in terms of that recognition in the constitution. We were most certainly here in 1900 when that document was written, but we were purposely left out of it. And even the prime minister at that time, way back in those days, did not think that indigenous people would survive and be here now. And there was a good attempt at that because there were so many massacres. Um, the last massacre of a huge number of Aboriginal people took place in the 1920s and it was mostly women and children. So right up, my, my grandmother was alive then. So right up to our grandparents' generation, massacres were happening in Australia. So it is time to actually right that wrong and make it very clear that we were here and recognised in the constitution. In terms of other groups having a voice, it makes sense that if we make a nation that listens to its First Nations people, then we will be a nation that values everybody's voices and will listen and unify and respect all cultures. And I think that's just a really beautiful nation for all of us to live in and bring up our children in. So I can say like, because you have been hearted, so you actually want to protect the other communities and also yourself in the future. So that's why you want to put that into the institution. You want to protect, yeah. Absolutely. And, and we really, it's our culture to value others. We, um, we are very community focused and, um, and I think this is such a, an easy thing for Indigenous people to understand and an easy thing for migrant groups to understand because we have that common ground. We know what it feels like to be excluded and to not feel seen. And so I think there is a lot of empathy and common ground. And I think that's why we're receiving so much support from migrant communities. Um, and it's a really lovely thing for us to all to be walking on this journey together. Because the alternative is, if we vote no and signal to government that we don't need to be heard, then it signals that you don't need to be heard either. So I think we all have a responsibility to come together, vote yes, and make it very clear to this government and the next government's coming, that we are a nation that listens and we are a nation that values culture and we are a nation that wants to be unified. I got a feeling like if we vote yes, it's not only protect indigenous people, but also protecting us. Yeah, yeah I believe that as well. I believe it really shapes the nation. It, it's uh, by, by recognizing Indigenous people in the constitution, it really shapes a nation that listens and respects and acknowledges, includes other cultures. You know, and I think that's a beautiful thing for all of us. Yeah, thank you. Um, so really thanks for your insight and your time. Do you have any final message to all the Chinese communities audiences? Mm, I guess my last message is this. It's a very moderate and fair proposal. It is about recognition and listening. You will not lose anything by voting yes. There's been a lot of um, incorrect information purposely trying to scare people. If you're hearing something that is really scary, then it is not true because there is nothing scary about an advisory committee there is nothing scary about making government listen and be accountable and spend their money more, our money, more wisely. And I tell you again, this is not about taking anything from anybody. It is about giving us a better chance as a nation to be more unified. And it's about equity for Indigenous people. We want to live the same amount of time as you. We want the same outcomes for our children as you do. So we really are calling on the Chinese community and all communities to stand with us, you know, to make this nation better and more united, fairer, 
and, um, and I encourage you to learn more about us. The Indigenous culture is a beautiful thing and um, yeah, we want to share it. So thank you. Um, Rachel Perkins, who is on the Yes campaign as well, has made a series of documentaries that um, helps people to understand what has happened in this country over the last 200 years. It's also really nice to learn about what happened prior to settlement. Um, you know, we were very peaceful and resourceful people who managed to look after this country uh, for 60,000 years. So we have a lot of amazing uh, things to share and um, I look forward to getting through this campaign, making sure that the result is successful and that everyone work, uh, votes, for a, a, votes for yes on the 14th of October because then we get to do the nice work together as a unified nation. So the way we've come up with this proposal is off the back of decades of work. So my elders worked really hard to try and stand up representative bodies who could provide good advice to government. That was largely ignored by previous governments, or in some cases we stood up representative bodies and then they were silenced by the next government. So we'd try again and then they were silenced by the next government. And we refer to that as political football. So instead of focusing on our lives, people will focus on the politics. Mm -hmm. So in 2015, the then Prime Minister pulled together the opposition leader and 39 Indigenous leaders and asked us, how do we want to be recognised and how can we start to close those gaps, um, fix the disadvantage? From there, a couple of years worth of consultation took place. So we had the most inclusive, extensive and well-resourced consultation asking thousands of Indigenous people, what do you think is the right way forward? How do we fix this? From there, we went to the Uluru Convention, Uluru Constitutional Convention in 2017 and 270 Indigenous delegates sat for three days and worked out what the plan was going to be. Mm -hmm. The Uluru Statement from the Heart was born there. It was read to the crowd and was endorsed by 250 Indigenous leaders. And the Uluru Statement from the Heart asked for voice, treaty, truth. Mm -hmm. So from there, we went and presented that to the then Prime Minister and he said no. He rejected our request to be heard. Okay. We kept trying. We are resilient people. And we finally got a Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, who agreed to take us to a referendum. Mm -hmm. So the proposal itself, and I want to be really clear, the proposal itself for recognition and a voice has come from Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. This current government has agreed to take it to the Australian public to vote on. So the government had to get involved to get us to a referendum. There is a legal process, a parliamentary process that is required. So Anthony Albanese did not write the proposal. Mm -hmm. He did not come up with it. He accepted the request from Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And that's where we've gotten up to that's so far. So this is not a Labor policy. It is not owned by any politicians. Okay. This has come from an overwhelming majority of Indigenous people who agree that we need to be recognised and we need to be heard. That's clear. That's very clear. Yeah, just just like Grace mentioned, many in Chinese communities, they just... Uh, uh, so that's a Labor, Labor government's policy. Mm -hmm. And if, the, if the, the, the outcome just come out with, uh, with yes, and uh, maybe the you know the other communities, whatever Chinese community, Korean community, and have a better better impression on Labour Labour Party. So that's a that's a current step mm. for the community. Yeah. So so please make it very clear that this is not this does not belong to any political party. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when all of that previous work was done, all the consultation, we actually had bipartisan agreement. Mm -hmm. So both. Um, both major parties agreed that we should be recognised and yeah. heard. And what we're seeing now, what we encourage people, vote yes, don't worry about how you normally vote in a political election because this is not a political election. Mm -hmm. And we have support from 
a vast variety of the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. This is about people and we're voting yes to inclusion, recognition and being heard. Let's leave the politics to the side. Look, and I fully understand that and I, I could really use your help in how to frame. We just need to make it really clear to people that an advisory committee, whether it be this advisory committee or any advisory committee, has no legal way of setting tax or increasing tax or taking anyone's home or affecting anyone's business. There's actually no legal way that that can happen. And we've been reassuring people of that. Um, if you can help to reassure people, that would be greatly appreciated because it's just not what this is about. Um, it's not the intention, but there's also no legal way that we could do that. Mm -hmm. So if you and I were to establish um, a Chinese media advisory committee that was established literally just to give advice about Chinese media, mm -hmm. that body couldn't go and take anybody's house or set taxes, could it? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the same thing, we just want to give advice. So mm -hmm. it does not take anything away from anybody else. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we've had people just tell lies about this, um, just to distract us from what we're actually trying to do, which is to vote yes. I think there is a misconception that this is all about welfare. It's about welfare in that it's about people's lives. This is not about increasing benefits. It's about actually being more sensible mm -hmm. with the resources that government does allocate to Indigenous people. We're very frustrated at the amount of taxpayers' money that gets wasted on things that do not equate to better outcomes for Indigenous people. Like myself, who are professionals, who are doctors, lawyers, um, you know, when I'm not doing this campaign, I'm actually the general manager of an environmental company. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we want to see that change. There, are, like I said, there is a huge number of Indigenous people who are in roles that we completely understand fiscal responsibility, and we want the government to be more responsibility with our mm -hmm. tax dollars. So. A change to the constitution will not equate to changes in Centrelink payments. It will not equate to Indigenous people just being handed money. It's about where government money gets spent. Just like um, in the Northern Territory, we have money that's spent where um, getting a Jewish museum built. We have a beautiful Chinese garden that ha that government money has been spent on because that was important to our community. And we're having an Aboriginal cultural centre built again because that was important to our community. So government money gets spent in all different ways. And, you know, that, that will continue. That will not be um, automatically decided because we then get recognised in the constitution. Um, this is about money being spent in the right way. So to anyone that's concerned that it means we all of a sudden get a whole lot of things that nobody else gets, it's not true. We want to get a voice. There's really unhelpful and really untrue stereotypes. Um, and I think that this year, because we're having all these conversations, there is a great opportunity to understand each other better. Um, so, you know, I want, I want the Chinese community to get to know the Indigenous community even better because there is a lot more things that we have in common than we would have realised before. And one of those main things is about wanting to be included and be heard and live happy, successful lives and to actually make a better nation for our children. You know, what nation do we want to leave behind for our next generations? I think that's another thing that our culture is very similar about is what, what legacy we leave for the future generations. And um, I think that's something that we can both influence by voting yes on the 14th of October.